the work. Um, uh, so you should be able to turn on live transcript on yours if you want to try that, although it is often not very useful. Okay. So uh, welcome everyone to the Should I Be Writing um, part one. Um, this is a workshop that I initially set up to do with my own thesis students and then we decided to open it up. And it's really wonderful to be here with so many of you uh, good hearted writers um, and to have space and time to talk about this. I've been giving these writing workshops of various kinds um, for about the last 15 years. And one of the things that I'm excited to do here today with you is to think about um, some of the things that have really shifted in my own thinking about what it means for us to help each other learn how to write and how to have less suffering in our writing. So it feels like a great gift um, to be able to, to talk together about these things. Um, I'm going to share my screen so that you, you can see just a few of these things in text form. Um, so uh, the question is, should I be writing? And that's the part we're talking about today. In a week on next Monday, we'll talk through how and when. Uh, so you can um, see where you wanna be with that. Um, the plan for today is to talk through why writing is so hard, um, why, why we have a hard time writing. And then we have a section that I'm calling baking our own bread, which is about the sense in which it's um, not possible to have these sort of store-bought cookie cutter approaches that are often offered to us for writing advice. Um, I'm finding a lot of traction in the idea of looking at ourselves as unique and ordinary. And then a big part of what we're doing today is thinking about um, intrinsic and extrinsic motivations and uh, thinking about on ramps and off ramps for our writing. We'll take a break uh, at about a quarter to the hour um, so that everyone can move around and get some more tea. And, uh, and I think unless there's any questions at this point, we'll dive in. Okay, so let's start by talking about why writing is so hard. I think that one big part of this that makes writing as a creative thing different than other forms of creative things is the speed with which we incorporate our experience of telling stories and making explanations for the world into school. So I think a lot about this um, image from Linda Berry. So on the slide is a, a drawing with some text and it says two questions. And it's an image of Linda Berry, the cartoonist. It's a cartoon of her um, asking in the thought bubble, is this good? Does this suck? Um, and she has one of her sort of friendly monsters alongside her. She says, I'm not sure when these two questions became the only two questions I had about my work or when making pictures and stories turned into something I called my work. I just know I stopped enjoying it. So thinking about school as a place that uh, takes the space of telling stories, making explanations, which many of us really loved doing when we were little and did with facility and ease and joy and turns it something into which we ask these questions of, is this good, does this suck? So writing is um, personal and vulnerable and also it's work that we aim to share. 
And perhaps because of that space of school being the site at which we use writing or share writing, often we end up moving it very quickly into a thing that is valuable by others that then gets um, freighted with uh, the capacity for someone else to tell us if we are good or we suck. Um, so I think it's just a sort of basic thing that loading something that's already hard, that just it's never not hard with um, all of the very various layers um, makes it harder. So we tend to have an approach to our writing where there's some impulse for it. And we'll talk more about what those different impulses are. Uh, but where the, um, the space that we enter into in our writing is already suffused by um, in internalizations of powerful others who have been really important to our self-formation, to our sense of who we are, uh, and to our sense of our potential and whether we're loved. Um, so it's a space that in psychoanalysis we call cathected. So many things, dense um, feelings are attached to things that don't necessarily can't necessarily bear the weight of the feeling that gets put on them. Um, so partially for that reason, and because we've come to think of writing through being evaluated on it, I think in school as a place where we should be judged and evaluated, where there is an external force that has the capacity to determine whether we're good or bad, um, often as we're, um, many people here are academics, many people are not in high school anymore. We end up using the force of what was made to work for us to push us through writing. So one of the main things that I see when I'm talking to people about writing or teaching about writing is a tendency to increase um, pressure or the threat of punishment as a motivation for writing. My former therapist calls this the fear, obligation, guilt complex. So we uh, try to get ourselves to write and often we're successful at getting ourselves to write through intensifying the things that we're scared of, uh, making the voice about our obligations louder, um, setting up structures where we feel really, really, really guilty. So we, we intensify the kind of negative affects in order to get ourselves through the writing process. Um, and that's a kind of repetition compulsion based on having had that done to us over and over again. The other piece is that, so we're right to want to resist those voices and those impulses. So to the extent to which those things are actually very mean and harmful, if we resist, if we turn back toward the impulse to have fear, obligation, and guilt structure our writing, it's actually um, very brave and true for us to say, fuck you, I'm not going to write based on those. Um, impulses. That's not a life I want to live. Um, but if we don't have any other way to do it, then we end up just stopping, right? The other big piece that I think happens is that we correctly identify, and this especially is true for people who are working as writers or who are in the academy in various ways, we are often really correct that the writing task that is offered to us is a neoliberal bullshit, a technical term. That means that we're being forced to perform in particular ways, or we're being asked to relate to our writing instrumentally or as only something that is fulfilling a credential 
but we're simultaneously being asked to relate to our writing as profoundly meaningful and authentic expression of ourselves that then can be monetized and transformed into the grist for the academic mill. So that also is something that is worth resisting. Um, we, we are correct to say that's not a good um, way to have everything that we create move. So I'm going to stop sharing and just pause here um, and, uh, and see if there's anything that anyone wants to, to say. Uh, yes. Is there anything that anyone wants to say or ask at this point? I've been more productive and literally more published since I retired. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have an account of that? Well, I mean, I, it, when we'll get to the off ramps, I, I mean, I would just say, well, what I love is teaching and I've got tenure. So fuck this, basically. I did tell them that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I published, but but since then, it's just been stuff I want to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will get an opinion. It's not like I don't seek some other people to you know, make a comment on my readings, but it's, it's been interesting. It's been more liberating. Yeah. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any others, questions or comments at this moment? Hi, can you hear me? I'm on the phone. I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, it's Cheyenne. Um, I'm just wondering why a lot of our schooling, if you have any thoughts on the fact that it, it's primarily about writing rather than, you know, maybe presenting or having like an open conversation about what you learned. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the, um, the piece of why writing is, uh, has this particular kind of status or fetishization in schooling has a lot to do with histories of, in our current moment, has a lot to do with histories of being able to assess, uh, which are the idea that we're going to be able to make something fungible and comparable, right? So some of this in a separate thing, I've been thinking a lot about the ways that grading becomes something that is the currency or the, the kind of um, transfer point between things that are personal, individual, unique, and things that are um, can be compared. And that comes down to the history of professionalization in schooling and the creation of the grade form which interestingly, I mean, we've probably talked about this. The grade form is something that only came into existence at the same time as there was also people resisting giving grades that could be compared between different institutions. So I think writing as a place of um, professionalization has everything to do with how can you examine it and how far away can it get? How fungible can it be made to seem? So that's the bad sort of neoliberal part of it. Um, and, and for that reason, we can also think about what it means for us to create ways of talking together, um, sharing knowledge and understanding that are not based on writing. But a lot of what I'm interested in here is how we can take back the process of writing from those fear, obligation, and guilt motivations, and also from the sense in which writing assessment is basically there to propagate a um, racist colonial approach to understanding the world. So I think that writing for us can be something that is liberatory and at the same time as we need to take seriously the ways it has been um, a force for oppression. It's also been a force for liberation, right? So that's a, that's a big part of how we tell these histories and how we tell these stories.
Okay. So I'll, I just want us to talk a little bit about this idea of baking our own bread. And then we'll have a little space for either going to talk together in a breakout room or doing some reflection on your own. Uh, okay. So um, many people have noticed that um, writing is hard. And so there's a lot of writing advice out there. Um, I've given a lot of writing advice. And uh, as I've been thinking about it, getting ready for today, and just thinking about it generally, I, I increasingly have come to this realization that writing advice is usually wrong. Um, there's this book, Art and Fear, that I've been a little bit obsessed with lately. Um, my friend Karen DeVries told me about it, and I felt actually a little bit mad because it came out in 1993 and I found it very helpful reading it. So it's a book that's about just creativity and making art. Um, and there's a part that's about what they call magic. So they're talking about learning from what worked for other artists. And they say, whatever they have is something needed to do their work. It wouldn't help you in your work, even if you had it. Their magic is theirs. You don't lack it. You don't need it. It has nothing to do with you. I don't have any kids, but one of the things that I've observed from all of my friends that have had more than one kid is this feature where they had a kid and they thought they'd figured out what more or less worked to raise their kid. And then they had another kid and they realized it just worked with that first kid, right? Because the kids are all different. So looking at a lot of different writing advice, books and blogs and things, lately what I've come to believe is that writing advice really has this quality that there are many things that have worked for someone and some of those things might work for us but none of them will necessarily work for us. And when people say anything definitive, they're probably wrong. So in my own writing advice, I was very compelled by um, Robert Boyce, who has studied some academic writers. And he's really the person who is responsible for the idea that we should be doing brief daily sessions of writing. Uh, there's another person who does writing advice, Helen Sword, who wrote an article that basically took his methodology apart and said, it turns out it's not doing these brief daily sessions. It's that the people who Robert Boyce was working with had him working with them. Um, so the thing that he thought was happening wasn't really what was happening. I think if we look around, a lot of writing advice ends up being like that. So the analogy that I'm suggesting is that we could do well to stop having kind of prepackaged writing advice uh, and instead to take the approach that we could be thinking about writing um, and reading what other people do, listening to how th they talk about what works for them, more in the mode of trying out different recipes. So, um, baking our own bread. So I think what I mean here is um, there are going to be things that are very specific to where we are and who we are and what's happening. And we can begin to know ourselves well enough to know what things are likely going to work for us. So if we can't eat gluten, the bread that we make shouldn't be based on making gluten bread, right? It shouldn't be based on kneading. If we have a limited budget for standing time, bread that requires us to stand and knead it for a long time isn't gonna work for us, but no knead bread might work for us. Um, it might be that, you know, anyway, you get the picture, right? The idea is that in our writing, 
we can begin to have some trust in our own understanding of who we are and what feeds us, what nourishes us, um, what we have a, a facility for. Um, if, you, if you like the narration of fermentation and things, and like, if you're someone who makes sourdough bread, which probably statistically during the pandemic, many people here have done, uh, you'll know that it's like these particular yeasts that live in your house that are mixed together with the particular amount of humidity in the air and how warm it is that day and all kinds of other things, right? So baking our own bread means we can begin to experiment and we can listen to how other people have tried things and then see if it works for us. The reason for us to think about that as experimental and something that we can try many of comes back to that sense in which it's likely that great violence was done to your capacity to love writing in your schooling. Almost certainly, not for everyone, but probably many of us experienced being um, demeaned, diminished, made to feel horrible about our language or something that we were interested in, shamed. So we don't necessarily know what works for us. It might be something that we have to discover new. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do is just take a moment, or more particularly about eight minutes, and I'm going to offer you the option to go into breakout rooms or to just take a minute and reflect for yourself on this, what's, what we've talked about so far. So what makes writing hard for you? If you have some sense of what the voices are that come up when you're being mean to yourself about your own writing, uh, if you'd like to talk about experiments you've made or things that you want to know more about what experiments might be. Um, so, so this is going to be, yeah, about eight minutes of just reflecting on these things, either together or on your own, whichever you like. Any questions before I give you this space? Yeah. Um, I don't know how to navigate a breakout room. I have no idea. I've never done it. So I'm just wondering if you'll tell us how to do this. <laughs> I will. Okay, so what you'll see, I'm going to pause the recording here. Okay, welcome back, everyone. I'm recording again. Uh, anything to report back or questions that came up in those rooms? Fear of sharing drafts, pick out room solidarity for room six. Yeah, Emily says several people in our group spoke up about lack of motivation, particularly at this moment in time. Yes, that's very real. Worries about mediocre ideas, imposter syndrome, yeah. Fear of not having done enough reading to be authoritative and research that is dark and draining on your mental health. Having that sense of feeling ideas and making that making it hard to translate those ideas into words. Being overwhelmed by the size of a project the guilt and fear that leads to avoidance and questioning why you thought you could do the task in the first place. Um, and then that quality of writing philosophy or writing theory, I think many people have this experience. That's hard because it's all about ideas. Because at least when you have data, you have something that you can critique um, and that can feel less personal. 
Also, many of us are in disciplines where people are jerks. Wanting perfection, but not knowing what that would look like or how to get it. Having not just one internal critic, but multiple internal critics and incompatible standards between the critics. Why can't the critics be consistent? Uh, and this feature of writing as a way to work through ideas, but that not necessarily being something that people want to read. So that space between getting traction yourself and giving traction to someone else. Finding yourself alone in a vacuum where you're writing a thesis or a dissertation where it's difficult to relate to others. And often that's structural, you get sent off to just somehow do the writing without any support. Um, as a scientist, realizing that really good discussion sections read like a wonderful narrative using the data. And then that sense of balancing types of writing, whether academic or creative or academic writing across and among disciplines. Okay, thank you. Those are really great. So a number of people raised both here in the chat um, and uh, in the preparation for this, this sense of um, wanting to do things correctly, feeling unmoored, not being sure how to motivate. Um, so all of the things that you're saying are really, um, they're real and, and widely shared. Ajay says, I feel like my ideas are either obvious or so obscure that they aren't important. I also constantly am concerned about speaking for other people that I shouldn't be. Um, yes, and Aaron says that feeling of not knowing what the paper is actually about, even when you have a complete draft. So I wanna focus in here a bit on this question of um, when our motivation is shut down because we feel that we have nothing to say or too much to say, or we don't have the right to speak of something. So the particular uh, cadence that we can get into where we um, feel that we have nothing to offer. Um, and then we'll see how this connects in with some of these other things. So I'll share the screen again. Is everyone feeling okay about having PowerPoint? Is it is it helpful? All right. Well, it's what it's what's happening. Okay. So I really like this concept, rainsome, which comes from a novel by Joe Walton called Life Load. And the definition in this novel, it's like a fond word. Uh, when someone is being very characteristically ourselves, themselves. So um, so I even had a feeling of being ransomed to myself as I was preparing for this workshop. I was suddenly rushing to get stuff done, although I've had weeks to prepare. Um, and it turns out that is just a way that I am. I rush to get things done. And there's a part of that that can be very cruel to myself um, because, uh, and you know, that probably I can figure out a pretty good narrative of where that started in my life. Um, one of the things that I've found interesting and useful about reading for one of the projects I'm working on, a lot of work in self-help and kind of inspiration porn Instagram. A useful thing there, I think, is the idea that we can work with ourselves just as we are. So instead of waiting to be a different person than we actually are in order to begin our work, we can start with who and how and where and when we are right now. So that quality of ransomness of being uniquely ourselves, I feel helps us when we're part of a bigger story that says we're only allowed to do writing if we're perfectible in some measure 
or if something changes so that suddenly writing will be possible. So that narrative that says we have to wait until later or after we finish a particular thing or when we become a different person, then we'll be able to write. I would like us really to lay that down and to begin with the idea that we are writing exactly where we are now and with the actual person we are now and with the people around us and the situation that we're in. And I'm not saying we shouldn't change things and make things better and take medication, but I think really one of the things this comes from is taking really seriously and starting for me in my life with disability theory and saying, we don't need to be different than we are in order to do our work. We're going to be working alongside and with ourselves. So that means, you know, like in that cartoon where the depression is like smothering us and then later it just kind of sits next to us while we work um, or however you want to picture that, right? Whatever operative metaphor you want. It's like, we can really love ourselves as we actually are. And we don't need to beat ourselves up for our weird habits that we've made in response to this hard world. We can begin with some feeling of feeling love and affection, even for the things that we do in our writing practice that are pretty weird and sometimes actually make our lives much harder. So lately, rather than having a plan for how everyone should do their writing, although next week I will offer you some sites of experimenting for like what, what you could try. But lately I'm really interested in what happens in our writing if we turn exactly toward how we really are right now and we don't think that we need to be someone else in order to do our work. And, and what would happen if we could have some affection for when we are rainsome, when we're being very characteristically ourselves, just as we are. So Viktor Frankl, um, who was a um, survivor of um, concentration camps and uh, one of the founders of a particular style of existentialist psychology, he says, let us not forget that each individual person is imperfect, but each is imperfect in a different way, each in his own way. And as imperfect as he is, he is uniquely imperfect. So expressed in a positive way, he becomes somehow irreplaceable, unable to be represented by anyone else, unexchangeable. So in a lot of the time when I'm looking at my own writing narratives and when I'm talking to others and especially working with students, there's a sense in which people feel like, who am I to say something? Who, who am I to even try to write something? Who, how could I be so arrogant as to say anything about this big conversation that has been going on since way before I came to it? Um, or conversely, how am I going to solve this enormous, difficult, huge problem that I feel so small in the face of? So this idea of relating to ourselves as worthy of doing our work because we are uniquely positioned just in virtue of being who we are, I find enormously helpful. So having this sense of being um, just being particular, being situated, being exactly where we are. And because of that, having something to offer to an ongoing conversation, just steps around the side of the question of whether it's arrogant to think that you have something to say, or whether you know, you're gonna say the most important thing or something that deserves to be said. 
It's like simply because you are yourself, you deserve to write something and uh, it will be interesting. So part of this um, comes, and forgive me, I'm going to quote a Facebook comment. Rendering our imperfection and our uniqueness as one of the things that moves our writing and that starts our writing doesn't mean that we have to think that we're um, better or more important or that it's, you know, we have to like become arrogant in order to write. Um, and this is a Facebook friend's friends, Mickey Ellinger um, wrote this just comment about thinking about being ordinary. So they said, one thing that helps me, it may or may not work for you, is not that I'm so special, but that I'm so ordinary. By which I mean that if I am worked up about something, war, cockroaches, people who take up two parking spaces, white supremacy, the Oxford comma, developing a movement to build a just society, a million other people are worked up about the same thing. I think this is interesting. It moves back against, pushes back against that neoliberal logic that you have to be like special and better in order to say something. And it renders this sense of because you have your unique thing and because you're ordinary, you have something that others will be interested in sharing. stopping sharing. We're going to take a 10 minute break. Before we do that, is anyone want to say anything? Tracy okay. Isaacs here. I, I love that quote. It's Isn't that great? Amazing. And it, it's really what's at the heart of good memoir, right? It's like a unique personal story, but it taps into something of wider resonance. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's right. Okay, I will pause recording. So welcome back. Uh, we're moving now into some of the writing down your own um, motivations and expectations. So I'll just give you a really quick uh, sense of what I mean by these things. So um, sorry, why, why are you not working? Well, can everyone see this even if it's not full screen? Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, internal and external motivations uh, are surprisingly hard to disentangle. I think about intrinsic or internal motivations in terms of Audre Lorde's sense of the erotic, which maybe many of you are familiar with. And I recommend you just go back and read that complicated, um, beautiful chapter from her book, Sister Outsider. She defines it as an internal sense of satisfaction to which, once we have experienced it, we know we can aspire. So intrinsic or internal motivations are those things, I think, that cannot be felt secondhand and that no one can tell you if you are feeling. So we could think about that existentially from the sort of Viktor Frankl point of view as those things that are uniquely your own. He has this very, I think, interesting approach to thinking about the question of the meaning of your life as something that life asks you and you answer through what you do with your life. Um, so that quality of like the only meaning we have being what we make. I think that the question of external motivations, often we frame as though they are um, bad in some way, or uh, as though they are something that is um, less noble and more 
um, venial. Um, so the external internal motivation narrative that we often have as writers tends to say that things that are um, not internal motivators of being completely authentic and really telling your true self, that those are somehow embarrassing, right? And, and this is a little bit also about that question of how academia structures what we're writing. So many of us have things that are reasons to get writing done that are not coming from an inner wellspring of the erotic, that sense of satisfaction to which once we've experienced it, all other things can be compared um, that are you know, the, the answer of our life's enactment to the meaning of life. And I think that there is actually some dignity and worth in recognizing the things that are externally motivated. So these are things like, you have to write a paper for a class. You need to um, write a syllabus to teach a class. You have a job that requires you to do some writing. Uh, so credentialing things or external motivations are things that are real and they have their own dignity. We don't actually need to demean them as just being part of the market or um, being fundamentally bad. At the same time, anything that we're doing that has that kind of external motivation is going to be something that we're giving some content, content to, which is actually us. I think it's correct that most of us are not capable of and not interested in being just total fakes, right? Like only doing something because we think that someone's gonna publish it or it's gonna be stylish later or that that is a sort of ugly feeling that I don't think we want to have. But being able to define or delineate what part of what we're doing is internal and what part is external is important because so much of the time, the things get cathected together, they get stuck together. So for example, you might feel like um, this person didn't value me or take me seriously or think that I could make it, or I live in an ableist world and they all think I can't do this hard thing. Um, and therefore I'm gonna do this hard thing and prove them all wrong. So that's actually a, a internal motivation, wanting to feel a sense of dignity and self-worth that's getting put on an external thing like getting a grant or finishing a paper or, and the problem there is that usually the feeling that gets attached to the relatively prosaic kind of workaday stuff is much bigger than those things. So like, I will never, no amount of um, external validation will ever actually resolve the fourth grade teacher who was extremely mean to me and told me that I was stupid. Like, I know that his voice is one of the voices that tells me that I should stop writing. And I'm sure you all have your own version of Mr. Cadell in your head and heart. Um, but actually there's nothing that I can do that will convince him that he was wrong about that. Um, so I'm going to have to find internal motivations that don't try to make that person in my past um, healed, you know, uh, through any kind of validation. Um, so I think that um, being able to delineate what the things are for you that are your internal motivations versus what the things are that are your external motivations helps uh, lay down some of the charge that we might have for um, why we're doing what we're doing and allow us to actually uh, make a distinction there. Um, so what I'd like to do is move back to um, just spend a few minutes on reflecting on internal and external motivation. So again, I'd like you to, to define external motivation 
as things that there actually is a way for you to measure whether you have met them at, or not. Does this part make sense versus internal motivations such as a felt sense of craft, writing a really good sentence, figuring something out that you've been thinking about for a long time, um, doing justice to a, a cause that you care about, writing a poem that expresses something. Um, any questions about the, the idea here, the plan? So once again, I'll give you some space to either reflect and if you're watching this video after we've, you know, as a recording, please take about eight or 10 minutes to do some reflecting on this. You could write down internal and external motivations in columns. For people who are here, I'll reopen the breakout rooms. Um, you can uh, click on breakout rooms and then join a room that you want to join. Um, or you can just, uh, and, and then you can talk about these things together or you can reflect personally. All right, I will pause the recording. And I've resumed recording. Uh, so I want to start with what Aaron is saying. They say, realizing as I write these down that I'm not currently feeling or benefiting from my usual internal motivations. For example, writing can be pleasurable, but it's not right now. So I'm trying to motivate myself entirely through the external side of the column. And that makes writing feel like a shitty chore rather than something I actually normally kind of enjoy doing. The pandemic has really dampened my writing spirit or motivation. Thank you, that's beautifully articulated. So I think it actually speaks to a bigger question or situation or problem, which is our normal scale for understanding what's happening in writing doesn't work for either internal or external motivation. So if our, if our internal motivation includes things like I really finally was able to say something about this important thing, or I understood how to frame this particular text, or I feel good when I um, am working on articulating this difficult part of my life. Um, those experiences usually happen in the midst of um, tremendous flailing around, you know, and all of us who have been writing for any amount of time probably can recognize and maybe actually be sort of bored by the particular sequence that we go through. Do you know what I mean? Where you're like, oh no, here I am at the part where I think everything I'm saying is totally boring and I have nothing. So we have these no standard narratives, right? I don't have any standing to speak on this issue or nothing I say is worth listening to or everything is just so obvious or whatever your personal narrative is, it will come up. And the external motivations, however you know, worthy they might be, are endlessly deferred, right? Such that you can't actually experience them in the day-to-day. -day. And mostly we have the experience that when they come, if they come, it turns out they don't solve things for us. So uh, wherever you are in your writing path, it's, I think, not wrong for me to say that mostly people, when they finish the incredibly hard thing that they've worked incredibly hard to achieve, many of us say, obviously, that thing wasn't as hard as I thought it was because I've finished it. So we overwhelmingly, <laughs> you know, diminish the thing once we actually accomplish the thing. Um, or sometimes uh, that feature of the um, conflicting narratives, conflicting and logically incoherent narratives come back. So maybe we have a wonderful thing happen to us. And then we say, you shouldn't be so excited about having a wonderful thing happen to you. Think of all the people who are having terrible things happen to them, right? So 
um, that's mean. Uh, and then there's the next thing. So we need to construct, and this is, these are the only two things I still feel sure about as I think about writing, having given up everything that I thought I knew. Um, and this is partially, I came to realize that I'd been very confidently giving lots of people different kinds of writing advice, but it was just because that was the writing advice that worked for me and people like me. Um, and now I have this feeling like, I don't know what's going to work for you. I have no idea. Uh, and I love that actually. And I believe that you could get an idea of what's going to work for you. Like, I think writing will always be very hard, but I don't think it has to be a site where you actually hurt yourself or um, make yourself feel terrible. And the secret is finding activities that allow you to stay long enough to let the waves of whatever your particular self-doubt, self-fear, um, letting whatever you, whatever the thing is that lets that sort of crash over you and let you continue with your unique work. I really feel confident that we can find practices and activities that let us do that. So one of the ways that I think about this is through having um, operative metaphors. So operative metaphors are less damaging ways for you to stay and to continue. Um, working at the right scale. So not trying to fix everything in the future and not trying to fix everything in the past. Um, so here's two. One, I am an oak tree. I make acorns. Uh, I don't know what's gonna happen to the acorns. They might get eaten by squirrels. They might go off and sprout other oak trees, but I'm just making lots of them, right? So that's an operative metaphor. Another operative metaphor is my work is an offering I light it on fire and send it off the river. Um, these are metaphors that work for me because they're about process. So, and they don't require me to control what happens, but they're gonna be really different than, off, than metaphors that work for you. So one thing that I'd like you to be thinking about over the course of this next week is an operative metaphor that is kind process oriented and allows you to find a way to stay through the storm when it arises. So that just gives you a little bit of anchor. Um, so part of this is um, I spent many years teaching mindfulness practice and um, trauma sensitive mindfulness. Um, and therefore reading things about emotion and cognition and, you know, who knows, but studies show that uh, our emotions move a lot. And the thing that stays is the narrative we tell about the feeling we're having. So that if we can just wait for about 30 seconds, our feeling will change. If we uh, tell ourselves a story that keeps the feeling going, it stays. So instead of there being just like continuous feeling, this theory is, you actually have some movement and the thing that um, makes something stretch and continue is the way you narrate it. This of course is inside the, um, the sense in which it's like, if we're completely depleted because we've been in a pandemic for a year, having a different story isn't going to necessarily change how we're feeling, right? But we can tell a different story than we're bad and everyone else is getting lots of work done and we should be writing a lot too, right? So we might need to tell, have an operative metaphor for right now that's like, 
I am a spring that has been drained by a drought and I need to refill before anyone can drink from me, right? That's a different metaphor than just like, I am a helpless lump. Um, so you have your own metaphor, but I, I would like it to be something that when that per those particular narratives that you know about yourself that you can identify as, those are pretty shitty voices that are saying mean things that have sometimes managed to force you like with a cattle prod to get to your writing. When those stop working, and they maybe shouldn't ever have worked, right? That was part of a violence of the academy or of schooling. What can you find that will let you stay with some softness and gentleness for yourself? So the, um, the things that I've found helpful as, or one way to think about this is through this idea of off ramps and on ramps. So we're coming into the last five minutes of today. And this is a workshop in two parts um, with this connective week. So I'm hoping that you can relate to this as an experimental week where you have a couple of tasks. Um, so the first one is that sense of like, can you find an operative metaphor that lets you trust yourself in, enough to begin to notice what the things are that are nourishing and what the things are that shut you down and to start to experiment with what things might work differently for you. Um, so if you're doing any writing this week, one of the things that I'd like you to try, so here are, here are these two technologies that are the ones I feel that I can stand behind um, because they bridge this scale. One is this sense of pausing for 30 seconds when you have an overwhelming feeling that uh, causes you to think you're going to stop writing. So you could actually like try that with a timer, like set a timer when you notice yourself feeling like I am too stupid to do this or I need to whatever it is, just to wait and see if something else happens. During that 30 seconds, you can play with uh, noticing different sensory perceptions. You could have um, a stone from a beach that you like, that you touch, whatever it is that works for you, but just experiment with um, weathering the 30 second storm. The next thing is to notice how things feel and what you do in response to them. So I think of this as on ramps and off ramps to your writing. So we have um, various machines that are attention theft machines. So like um, Facebook and Twitter, um, they're you know, built to be off ramps from the other things that you want to do. Um, a way that I work with those things are to um, have an internet blocker so that when I want to take that off ramp habitually over and over again, I just, those websites don't load on my computer. Um, but I ask you to think about what your on-ramps and off-ramps were over the last week. So they are things that are very good reasons for you to do something other than writing. And usually they are helping someone else, cleaning something, uh, reading something. Those are the main ones. So these are all really good things. So I'd like you to just notice what happens when you feel that urge to leave and how you might re-narrate. And I'd like you to actually cultivate this week a practice of um, talking to yourself that is very gentle and that acknowledges that you're offering yourself something that you actually care about. So you might say, yes, it is very important to clean that thing that you've noticed you want to clean. Let's do that in a certain amount of time after you get some writing done. So this is specifically when you have the urge to write, um, notice what comes up and notice you know, what you can do to not leave. Um, it's harder than some people who are doing artistic practice who have like 
they experience the joy of dancing or painting or playing music. Many of our joys of being writing, being writers have, it's been so long since we really experienced that, that it's hard for us to come back to like, what was our practice? And for many of us, our practice of writing is hard to access because of the conditions we're in. So for me in Ottawa, I can't go and meet up with people in a cafe and write together. That's one of my main writing on ramps. That's the way that I've gotten a lot of things done. So notice what the things are that let you start. Um, again, from that art and fear book, they say, the thing is not that we um, never stop. It's what allows us to start again, right? What allows us to start again? So I just want to note two things from the chat. Um, Ajay asks, you know, how do we think about when you have lots of other people who are suggesting what you should think and write about? Um, and like, how can you know what you actually want to? And coming back to something that many people raised about motivation, like how can you feel motivated? So this week, if you can, I would like you to be not doing too much writing. So not trying to be excessive, but trying to be really attentive. And then to notice when you feel excited and curious about something. So to let yourself try to follow your pleasure rather than following the particular habit of because other people care about this, you care about it. So I know I'm being kind of woo woo here, but it's there is something about finding a way to trust that you actually do have a direction that if you follow it, it takes you somewhere. So being very small, that's what I'm interested in this week. We have to stop um, because I believe in ending on time. Are there any closing uh, questions or clarification things between now and our next meeting next Monday. Okay, well, um, thank you all so much for being here. It's really wonderful. Um, and I look forward to next week. Um, I will uh, put this up and um, and do you feel like you know what you're going to try to do this week? Is everyone okay? <laughs> Great. All right. Um, well, thank you. We're going to have this very weird um, suddenly closing things. I will stop recording. Uh,